Uh, we are beginning with two plenary talks this morning. The first one is by Dr. Rene Roy of Curano, Canada. He is with Hydro-Quebec as a hydrometeorologist in uh, the water management group. And he's responsible for hydromet data acquisition and forecast of the reservoirs for the Qu Quebec hydroelectric public utility. He's also been deeply involved in water-related projects in areas like China and Poland. In addition, he acts as scientific director for the Kuranos Consortium, a world-leading organization dedicated to the acquisition and development of knowledge on climate change, its impact, and related socioeconomic and environmental vulnerabilities. So let's welcome Dr. Roy. Uh, I'm glad to be here this morning uh, with you to share some of the work we've been doing over the past few years uh, with respect to climate change in the energy sector, or more specifically in the hydropower sector. So I would like to thank uh, organi organizers of this event uh, for sending this in invitation in uh, which they kindly requested uh, if we could address one of the topics that you see uh, listed uh, at the bottom of, of this figure. So uh, this morning, uh, uh, I'll be more than happy to address the first two topics. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I spent my whole career in between meteorologist, climatologist, hydrologist, and uh, hydropower uh, managers, uh, operators, planners, and uh, hydropower equipment designers. Uh, so I will, I will bring this morning a few examples of uh, good practices, if not best practices, helping Canadian electric utilities adapting to climate change. I find it quite a challenging issue. I need to keep your attention for the next 30 minutes. It's Friday morning at the very end of a, a, of a very good conference, stimulating and richful. And, and uh, for a second reason, and I show a picture here, and I'd like you to raise your hand, those uh, one in the audience who know who this gentleman is. Got, oh at least one person. And if I had a clue, this logo of the Colorado Avalanche, do you have any clue? Any idea? This gentleman is called Patrick Roy, and he's the head coach of the Colorado Avalanche, the NHL team representing Colorado. So we got the same family name, but we're not related any other way. Uh, Patrick Roy was a famous goaltender uh, very talented, uh, you can see here raising the Stanley Cup with the Colorado Avalanche, and he did that prior with the Montreal Canadiens, where I do come from. So being named Hawaiian Colorado could bring very high expectation, and I hope this morning I'll meet uh, the challenge. So here's my uh, own team, the, the heart of the team I'm working with, with the uh, fields of expertise uh, being uh, shown on this, uh, on this image. So. We got a micro meteorologist, hydrologist, spe specialist in statistics, geostatistics, uh, geographical information system, computer science. And those three ladies couldn't make it for the, the day we took the picture. So we have here uh, two uh, hydro engineer, uh, specialized in the design of hydro equipments, and a climatologist. So a lot of science uh, being uh, merged into uh, our team. So here's the outline of my presentation. I'll say a few words about the Oranas Consortium. We'll talk about climate change in Quebec, uh, impact anal analysis on either the electric load and the uh, hydroelectric generation capacity. We'll say a few words about uh, adaptation strategy and I will conclude. But first, I would like to refresh uh, some notions of geography in the assistance. Uh, Quebec is here at the far northeast end of the uh, North American continent. It's in size comparable to the southwestern US uh, states, including Colorado, 8.2 million inhabitants uh, living mostly in the southern portion of, of this area. And to give you an idea, here I show a lot uh, in this table uh, some countries and the number of times you can fit uh, these countries into 1.5 million square kilometers. So 50 times Belgium, five times Italy, three times Spain. So it's a quite uh, important uh, surface. And the, the province is, uh, is 
fed by uh, a, in electricity, I mean, by a state-owned utilities, 20,000 employees, six, six billion U.S. dollars of assets as per 19, as per 2014. I'm, I'm sorry for the mistake here. Should be more than that by 200, 2,000. Uh, we, we have a lot of, of transportation, distribution, equipments, as you can see, as you can see here. And as per generation, 99% uh, of the energy produced is, is from hydro, from our 62 powerhouses, uh, more than 36,000 megawatts uh, installed capacity, 27 reservoirs, a lot of dams, and we also have wind energy. It's modest, but we have some. Uh, uh, we, we have a lot of water up north, and it's in this, these areas, a thousand kilometers from here, Montreal, we're producing electricity, nine, uh, I mean 80% of the electricity up north and have it uh, uh, transported where uh, th this elec electricity is consumed uh, in the, along the St. Lawrence River Valley. Now, so I, I've made geography, uh, now let's go for history. Uh, those pictures are related to the 1996 Saguenay flood, uh, which hurt badly at the north of the uh, Quebec province. You can see by those pictures. Uh, more than 270 uh, millimeters fell on a 36-hour uh, period, which is twice more than the average for the month of July, with the following consequences. People died, a lot of damages, estimated to 650 million. Uh, houses, cottages, dams, and dikes were uh, damaged or uh, or, uh, or uh, destroyed. And we've adapted to these conditions after the event uh, by changing the water management plan, by uh, modifying some infrastructures, and by improving the flood forecasting system. Second event I wanted to re refer to, two years later, we've suffered from a great ice storm in the uh, Montreal area. Montreal is here. So huge system were stuck just south west of Montreal, three different storms uh, uh, within a week, 120 millimeters of freezing rain over this densely populated area, uh, with uh, important impacts as well, 25 person died, 1.25 billion US dollar in damages, poles and pylons collapsed, and a lot of people uh, were blacked out, uh, some of them for uh, a month. Here again, we adapted after this event by reinforcing transmission line, building new uh, 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 high voltage line, uh, some underground transmission lines. So we've, we've adapted to these extreme conditions. And here, I, I don't pretend that these events are related to climate change, but at least they are weather related, which makes us aware that uh, we're vulnerable to weather and uh, also that we can adapt to these uh, extreme conditions some way. The third element that, that wasn't shown on TV, uh, neither on, on, the, uh, on uh, newspapers, is, uh, is the dry period that you can see here on this graph. In fact, this graph shows the departures, inflow departures from the mean annual value, feeding all uh, powerhouses uh, operated by Hydro-Quebec. The mean annual value uh, is, is shown here, 212 terawatt hours. So on average, in a year, we receive water feeding our reservoir. And since we know uh, the capacity of all our powerhouses, we can express instead of megawatt, instead of cubic meters per second, we can express these inflows in terawatt hours. So you have departures here from, from the mean values. And you can see that we have in blue uh, uh, wet years and in red dry years and at the moment we were uh, thinking of creating Uranas, the consortium on, clim on climate change we uh, were uh, suffering from a long dry spell from 1985 until 2001 so uh, hydro quebec decided also to get on board to work on, on climate change and i can update this this image where you see that even after uh, 2001, we had dry years. To give you an idea, a, a ter terawatt hour is, is on average $30 million. So this single 1989 years represent 
a deficit of a uh, billion, billion dollars. Overall period is around seven billion dollars deficit. Though, with, with all these events, Oranas was born in 2001. It's an initiative from the Quebec government. And the, the government decided that weather-related disasters would be a public safety issue with the important economic consideration that, that you can imagine. And uh, the research on climate change uh, would be oriented toward uh, users' needs. And I'll describe to you what, what Uranus is in a moment. Uranus is a, is a boundary organization dealing with regional climate uh, modeling climate scenarios and services, climate impacts and, ad and adaptation. And on, on this schematic, you can see the red circles are university, the green one are electric utilities, and we have also on board the Quebec and the federal uh, Canadian government. About 400 collaborators. Uh, since 2002, we've realized more than 100 projects. So here's the membership in, in more details. Uh, we got uh, four uh, formerly 14 members, eight from the Quebec government, eight different ministries, Hydro-Quebec, Environment Canada, and four universities listed on the right-hand side of, of, this, uh, of, of this slide. In uh, 2007, we've opened a membership to, uh, got on board, to get on board uh, Manitoba Hydro, Ontario Power Generation, and uh, Rio Tinto Alca, and two new universities. Uh, we got 40 employees on the payroll, uh, 35 contributed collaborators from, from the members, and uh, we collaborate with uh, more than 400 uh, researchers and professionals. Our mission is to acquire, develop relevant climatological knowledge, and to inform and advise decision makers and stakeholders. So here's the organizational chart. I'd like to draw your attention on the bottom uh, portion of, of the screen. Uh, where it shows how we are organized, three different groups, climate simulation and analysis, climate scenarios and services, and vulnerabilities, impacts and adaptation. And under vulnerabilities, impacts and, ad and adaptation, we have 10 different programs addressing uh, 10 different issues, it ranges from uh, northern environment, built environment, tourism, forest resources, energy, uh, water management, and so on and so forth. And we also have a unit dealing specifically with an economical issues related to the adaptation in all those uh, fields of uh, uh, all those sectors. The as per the hydro uh, users motivation, uh, they, uh, they would like to, to improve their knowledge of future climate and impacts in order to either uh, limit the effects of, uh, uh, limit the adverse effects, I should say, for specific activities or to take advantage of some potential changes. And this is uh, uh, what the energy program of Uranus is, is all about. So I'll remind you what the objectives is, are. Uh, it's to strengthen the capacity of Uranus member operating in the energy sector to adapt to climate change and to natural climate variability, which is important. So ultimately, we'd like to support member companies in uh, identifying, assessing, and implementing <laughs> adaptation measures. But, but before getting to that, uh, we need to participate in, support, and guide scientific research uh, to, need, to meet member needs. Here I show a few uh, R&D axes that, that are of interest by these days uh, with respect to the energy uh, program at Uranus. And we can do that in different ways. Uh, it goes from innovative or more fundamental research that we can do related to essentially to uh, process analysis uh, with, with our partners from the universities. And we ca can also act as uh, experts or consultant. Uh, so if operators, managers do have a question, they, they can just take the phone and, and uh, raise their question and, and we do our best to answer these questions. Let's go now and, and look at um, projected, projected, I'm sorry, uh, climate changes in Quebec. Information is uh, taken off from uh, this document uh, called Towards Adaptation. I'm sorry, it's only in French, but it's available online for those who are interested. Uh, it, it's been issued uh, last December. 
So let's go quickly to what, uh, what's been first observed. This is the trend uh, in the uh, temperature observation, uh, observed from 1950 uh, until 2011. And it looks like for almost all the stations, uh, we had uh, uh, increase in temperature over this 62 years period, reaching uh, up to three Celsius degree. On this one, on the left a panel, uh, you can see the uh, observation from the period 1971 to uh, 2000. And the, the three uh, maps on the right hand sides are the uh, simulation using RCP 8.5, the 50th percentile on the centered box, and the two small maps are the 10th and uh, 90th percentile. So it looks like uh, as as far as, temp as temperature is concerned, the warmer colors of the uh, centered map uh, suggest that uh, temperature uh, will raise, will augment by two or three degrees in the southern portion of Quebec. Let's have a look at precipitation now for the same period, 1950 until 2011. Uh, for the majority of the uh, observation st station, the uh, precipitation increased over that period of, of up to uh, 20%. Let's have a look at the future by comparing the two uh, central maps. It's, it's not that clear uh, on this one, but uh, if you look closely uh, here again, uh, the central map suggests that uh, precipitation may increase uh, in the southern part, at least the southern <coughs> east part of the province. It's clearer, the signal is clearer for the uh, projected uh, maximum annual snowpack. Uh, you can see the reddish portion of the central map uh, showing that uh, the maximum annual snowpack will be reduced uh, by year 2050. So all of these changes in climate will uh, for sure affect uh, Hydro-Quebec, uh, uh, either its energetic inflows the energetic demand or, or issues related to extreme events. So uh, once we know better what uh, the, the expected uh, climate conditions could be, we are now uh, looking into different aspects or, or practices, activities within the business, and we're looking if it might be uh, interesting or, or if it's economically sound to adapt to the expected uh, conditions. The process to get there is, is rather straightforward. We identify vulnerabilities or opportunities. Uh, we develop climate scenarios. We analyze the impacts on, on these targeted activities. We develop adaptation strategi strategies and we implement them. So it looks easy, but uh, in practice, it's, it's a little more difficult. Let's have a look at the impacts now on the uh, electric demand. This is a picture of Montreal by night uh, over winter time. Uh, the problem is as follow. Uh, we have an electric demand in Quebec, which is highly related to temperature, since people are, are warming or eating their house electrically. And the load forecast, though, uh, rely, requires reliable weather and climate information. And beyond for this forecast, be, first 10 days we use uh, weather prediction and then we rely on 30 years uh, reference climate normals. But it looks like in the last two decades, the temperatures uh, got warmer and it, it causes a problem. And I illustrate this problem uh, here with, with this graph of temperature, mean temperature, southern Quebec. So we got the temperature here uh, between 1940 and 1990 for a 50 years period. And here's the 30 uh, years average for the first three decades, 1940, 1970, 1950, uh, 1980, and 1960 uh, to year, 1961 in fact to year 1990, which is officially still the, uh, the, the climatological standard normal. Uh, and you will agree with me by looking at this graph that the, uh, at least for this period, the hypothesis of, of stationarity holds. But if we had 10 years to this graph, uh, you can see that the mean 30 years average increases. And we, if we had another uh, 10 years, it, it still increases even more. And the difference between the standard climatological 
uh, period of reference, and the one uh, centered on, on 1995 is, is close to uh, point, point 0.5 degrees, so half a degree over that, that period. So if we look on a longer, uh, longer term from uh, 1900 to uh, 2010, and you fit this uh, normal period here, uh, the question to be raised is, is the standard normal, so 1961-1990 period, representative of actual conditions? And uh, I think we all agree that it is not. So we've, we've recommended, I mean, Uranus, that this period of reference would, would be modified, would be updated, and, and we recommend to use uh, the period of 1971 to 2010, which includes uh, warm years, the most recent warm years, and we kept it a long record to uh, keep track of the climate variability. And we also recommended to uh, update this, uh, this, this, period, this uh, reference period. At the same time, many utilities, mainly in the US, decided to go inverse way and, and to shorten uh, their, their reference period to 20 or, or 10 uh, most recent years. Let's have a look at what it looks like in, in uh, year 2050, 35 years from now. The, the table and the graph shows the same information. It's the warming by uh, Celsius degree for by 10 years. And uh, according to, to these simulation from 39 uh, climate scenarios different, looks like uh, temperature will warm more rapidly over winter time than, than over summer time. And there are consequences on the electric load at this time horizon. Here I show the difference uh, in terawatt hours of the load uh, uh, requested by the domestic uh, uh, customers. I distinguish residential from institutional and commercial. And for residential, since uh, uh, winters are going to be warmer, uh, we will need less electricity. Uh, to heat our homes. It, it's partly uh, compensated by an increase in the demand for cooling houses during summertime, which are going to be warmer as well. Uh, inst for institutional commercial uh, uh, consequences are, are not that important because they are not eating uh, using electricity and the penetration of, uh, of cooling is already very important in this sector. So at the end of the day, if you look at the total difference between, uh, uh, between the blue and the red bar, <laughs> so the gray bar at horizon 2050, we, the, the uh, domestic uh, users may, uh, may need something like eight terawatt hour less of electricity, but it, it's not such a big deal because we do have access to export market uh, other provinces in Canada and to US market. So now I'll step into hydrological impacts, I'll show you the methodology, which again is quite straightforward uh, and well known in, in our field. Uh, so from emission scenarios, we're, we're feeding a global circulation model and uh, we have to scale uh, these outputs. We can go either through a dynamical downscaling through a regional climate model or using, by using other scaling methods to produce scenarios that are, go are gonna be used by hydrological models to foresee the impacts on the hydrological regime that is useful for different uh, field of activities uh, listed here. So first attempt we made to evaluate the impacts uh, on, on uh, hydro regimes was done in 2005. It relied on 25 uh, climate simulation and we provided brackets for each of the river system operated by Hydro-Quebec. You can see the results here. In the James Bay up north where we produce a lot of electricity, it ranges from 7 to 20 percent. And we've also looked at the intra-annual uh, consequences of this climate evolution. So you have here a lot of hydrographs. The black line uh, represent the actual, actual conditions uh, uh, from years mean and uh, averages values from 61 to 2004. <coughs> and all these spaghettis covered by an envelope is the uh, potential uh, uh, future possible horizon 2050. And you can see from this graph that, uh, not surprisingly, the inflows over winter time 
are going to be more important and the spring freshet could come earlier from a few days to a, to a couple of weeks. <coughs> During 2005 and 2012, we've worked a lot on the observation. We've, locked on, we've worked on climate scenarios. We've worked on modeling tools as well, improving uh, definition of processes, algorithms, and all our hydrological model. And uh, we came out in 2012 with a collaboration with three organizations in Quebec. Uh, Hydro-Quebec, the uh, a government agency responsible for managing water resources in Quebec, and uh, Rio Tinto Alca through a project uh, called CQ2, uh, which stands for Climate Change Discharge Quebec. So we covered all the, uh, almost all the watersheds in Quebec and we've uh, estimated what could be the impacts of uh, climate evolution at the horizon 2050. So we've been using a single hydrological model called HS HSAMI, a lumped conceptual model. Uh, we've been using hydrological simulation for two, uh, 306 watershed and uh, climate scenarios were taken from CMIP3 experiment. 87 climate projections were used, taken out from uh, GCMs, RCMs, with different GHG scenarios. So we've been using 87 climate projections, five post-processing methods, so it turns out that we have uh, repeated the experiment uh, 535 times. And here I'm, I'm going to be showing map presenting those results, Horizon, again, 2050. This one shows the changes in mean annual flow at this time horizon. The scale ranges from 0 to 15%. And you can see by this map that uh, there is a, a gradient from southwestern part to northern part. The inflows uh, difference could be, uh, could be more important uh, on the northern part of the province. And together with these maps uh, presenting uh, mean flow change, we, ha we have what we call consensus or agreement maps. This is the, the right-hand side panel. And uh, we, we uh, consider uh, either uh, decrees or, or entries most probable if we have more than 90 uh, scenario out of the 435 pointing in the same, same direction. We consider them uh, the, the, the decrees or entries probable if more than 75% of the uh, projections are pointing in the same direction. So what's interesting here uh, for Hydro-Quebec, we're producing hydroelectricity in, in a portion of the territory where we expect inflows to become uh, greater, and almost all the projections are pointing in this same direction. So it gives us confidence in the results that are being produced. <clears throat> and for those one of you who are uh, thinking that uh, CMIP-5 could change significantly the results. It, it's not the case. We have the same kind of pattern. Here my colleagues decided to change the blue tints, uh, but uh, you have to agree with me that, that the schemes on those two maps are look, look pretty much the same. CMIP 5, in this case, we've been uh, using all the RCP scenarios. So here's a map of the change in max annual snowpack. So uh, obviously, in the southern part of the province, uh, uh, maximum snowpack will decrease. We'll, we've seen that earlier. And it looks like there is a good agreement between all the projections for this portion of the territory. While uh, we've also uh, investigated the uh, changes in timing of the spring freshet. So if you read the scale here in the southern part of Montreal, the spring freshet com could come like 10 or 12, 12 days earlier than it's the case today. And we have a very good agreement between all the scenarios. So this decrease is most, is most probable. So let me recap what we've done uh, between 2005 and 2014. On this sketch, uh, you see the number of projections increasing. And we went from IS-92A to uh, CMIP-3 and then uh, CMIP-5 more recently. Um, we've, uh, we've estimated the mean changes uh, during all these experiments, and it looks like it, it's always in the, same, in the same ballpark, ranging from 10 to 14% of increase 
at this specific reservoir Lagrange, and the standard deviation uh, of the change is, is smaller than the signal, which is interesting as well. Now, let's make a step on adaptation strategy, and I'll define the problem we have to cope with. Imagine any uh, hydropower uh, uh, equipment. It's, it's been configured uh, it's been configured according to current climate and current hydrology. So we have given operational rules and given com configuration of the physical equipment, which was based and designed on what we've observed in the past. If we got evidence that, that uh, climate is changing, uh, of course, there's going to be change, uh, important changes at the hydrological regime as well. So we may have to revisit uh, either the operating rules or the configuration of, of these equipments. So here's the experimental design prior to really adapt that we're suggesting, and I'll go step by step by first describing the reference case. Uh, imagine here that we apply this experiment to a powerhouse. So the performance you, you calculate here is the output of your, of your powerhouse in megawatts. So first is the reference case, current climate, current hydrology, initial operational rule, initial physical configuration, and you can simulate by using uh, numeric tools the performance of your equipment under these conditions. And you can have the uh, climate evolving with impact on, on hydrology as well, and you keep the same initial uh, operational rules and, and initial uh, physical configuration, and you uh, calculate the performance or the output of your powerhouse, and you compare it to the reference case. You can, you can also decide, uh, if you have the tools to do that, to adapt operational rules, operating rules, and you can, again, calculate the performance if you do so. And ultimately, you can uh, change the operational rules and the configuration of your equipments, say, add capacity, change turbine, and so on and so forth. Remember that these are, are most costly. And you can compare the performance of, of these adaptation measures to the, uh, to the standard case. Now, now let me show some results while comparing uh, a case where uh, we've uh, had the uh, hydrological conditions changing and adaptation and adapted the operating rules for a uh, powerhouse in Quebec. On this, uh, here I show two box plot, uh, Horizon 2050. And it's uh, the, what it represents is the hydroelectric uh, generation or the proportion compared to the control period. On the left panel, it's without adaptation, right panel uh, with adaptation. The first box plot is always the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the control period. And we've repeated the experiment 10 times using 10 different uh, climate scenarios into an hydrological model and a, a simulation uh, a tool which simulate the, the power generated by, by this powerhouse. And it looks like without adaptation, there's a decrease in the production of the, of the powerhouse, while if you adapt, you can, you can gain in, in production. This work's been done by a PhD student that, that is now working with us. Now, if you are uh, expecting uh, adapting physical configuration. We have two specific cases uh, we've been working on. Uh, the first one, uh, and, and here uh, I show on this graph, I've, I've plotted, in fact, the output of two uh, regional uh, climate uh, simulation, Horizon 2011. And, and what I show here is, is the runoff. The solid lines are the have, uh, running average 30 years, and the dotted line that you don't see that much is the, the trend. Uh, so uh, the, the Lagrande Dirt Generating Station was commissioned in 1975, 19, I'm sorry, 79. Uh, it was designed according to the observation, hydrological observation between 1960 and that period. And we've operated that, that power station until, uh, until this year. And we're now investigating the possibility of refurbishing this powerhouse. And two cases uh, are considered. Uh, we can either design it according to the historical information, or we can also, and this is what we've suggested, design according to the expected increase in, in inflows. The second case 
is, is, is also a real case. Uh, uh, Manitoba Hydro will be installing a key gas generation, generating station to be commissioned by 2019. Uh, they've, they've, uh, they, they could either uh, design their station according to the historical and from, uh, observation and project them in the future, or they can use uh, information taken out the climate models, and this is specifically what they'll do to design uh, this, this powerhouse. Uh, I'm running out of time, but I've listed here uh, 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 ongoing projects uh, we're working on, so if you'd like to get some more information, I'll be uh, more than happy to answer, uh, to answer your, your question about these projects and to describe uh, them. They're all publicly available, so this information is available to, through our, our website. Let me just take a minute to describe this project which is about to be completed. We've identified in the last few years uh, uh, 200 studies uh, where uh, in, in the field of energy where people adapted their operations or, or design and we've selected the, the most interesting one, we've documented them and we've taken lessons learned from these studies. So this information might be valuable for your organization. If, uh, if you'd like, I will be, would be happy to share this information with you. So in conclusion, uh, interactions between energy, meteorological, and climate, climate experts is a key element to improve energy sector adaptation to climate change. And these interactions, we believe, can be more efficient and fruitful when realized within a boundary or organization. And this is all uh, what WebC is all about, so we're quite supportive of this uh, initiative. Canadian electric utilities are active in improving their knowledge of potential climate, uh, uh, potential impacts of climate change, and we're considering adapting to those new conditions. Uh, we've seen that the impacts of on demand is, is not such a big deal for us, but it, it will be more important uh, to consider the changes to the hydrological regime. We've seen some results. And finally, I uh, have to mention that Hydro-Quebec already considers climate change for different field of activities, but you have to keep in mind that this element of risk is only one consideration that has to be taken when planning a, a project. Thank you very much. Okay, we have some time for a few questions. I was wondering, when you talk about precipitation, do you mind precipitation minus evaporation, or is it pre precipitation? And how big is the change of evaporation in a climate change scenario? That's a very good, that's a very good question. In fact, that's a key element of, of our actual work. Uh, we're working deeply uh, since Lofgren from GLURL uh, pointed out that uh, we may have uh, underestimated uh, the impact of evapotranspiration I'm, I'm sorry. on the net balance. Uh, we're working actively now to uh, reproduce adequately this variable. But we're not doing very well, actually. Uh, to what extent do you think decadal variability, unforced natural decadal variability, may be playing a role in this, yeah. or should be considered? Yeah, this is, again, a very good question. The, the, uh, that has been raised by the operator. They we're foreseeing what's gonna happen uh, horizon 2050, but how are we gonna reach uh, 2050 is, is, a key, is a key question as well. So by looking at different climate scenarios, we, we, we can see that even though we're uh, foreseeing an increase in, in, in inflows, uh, for some scenarios, it, it, it has to go by a decrease. So we're now considering, you may have seen on the ongoing project, seasonal to decadal uh, forecast because uh, it's not all about what's gonna happen in 2015. We, we have to investigate further what's gonna happen in the next few years or, or in a decade. I'd like to ask question two. Um, I think it's great that you're being proactive and making business decisions based on how you really think 
the climate is going to evolve. Um, as for the business decision, there surely was some sort of an economic analysis of gains versus losses. You know, if you um, are correct and you build the dam so that it will hold the higher volume, there will be a gain for the company, but if for some reason it is wrong and you have too big a dam, what are the losses? How were those decisions made? Another good question. You pointed out uh, something very interesting as, as per economics are, are considered. Uh, we're, we're quite confident that there's going to be more water flowing to the reservoir up, up north. So it's not a question of, of being wrong on, on that point. The point uh, related to economics is, is, is the fact that uh, considering uh, the discount rates being used, the gain that we're going to make uh, in 30, 40, or 50 years are irrelevant into, uh, into economic analysis. So this is, this is a bad point for the people who promote adaptation to, to climate change. But on the other hand, uh, you can accumulate reasons why you should adapt to climate change. And for the James Bay uh, complex, uh, we've, we've pointed out that inflows could, could increase, but I'm not sure if the managers would have decided to invest million dollars just because we've said that. But on top of climate change uh, impacts, we also know that the, it, it, by having larger turbines, we, we will have more uh, room and, and more flexibility managing this hydroelectric complex. So if you combine a few, a few uh, elements, uh, you can come up uh, with uh, adapting to these uh, forcing conditions. Hi, Laura Hinkleman, University of Washington. Um, I live in Seattle, and in the state of Washington, um, the majority of electricity is produced from hydropower, and the drinking water also comes from the dams, and we rely very heavily on the snowpack. And this year, we had an extremely warm winter, and the snowpack is already gone. <laughs> and so there were some big decisions to be made as to how to um, uh, handle this. And, and this year, they made a decision to close the dams much earlier than usual. And the result is that um, the claim is that we'll be fine for drinking water and hydro this year. So I'm, actually, my question is <laughs> this. Um, I understand that the um, operators of the dams, very much like the operators of the electrical utilities, are very conservative. And for them to have made this decision, which is a complete break with normal operating procedures, was an extreme risk for yep. them and a very unusual. And I was wondering how difficult it's going to be uh, to change your operating procedures and how much resistance you think there would be. I see you've got a lot of utilities on board, so maybe it's not so bad. Yeah. If you would have asked the question 10 years ago, I, I would have said that it would be difficult. But since over the past 10 years, they themselves they observe the climate evolving. It's, it's their reality. So based on the last year's experience, now they, they're willing to take some risks and, and uh, operate the, the, uh, the dams and reservoir according to what we foresee in the next, in the next year. So good for us that the actual or most recent conditions are aligned with what we're foreseeing in the next decades. Okay, so let's thank Dr. Ra again. Oh, thank you.